Hello and welcome to another midnight showing. Although this is not really midnight and it's a week late. So, <laughs> forgive me, the dog wanted to be inside. Say hi, say hi, say hi, say hi, hi. This is Archer, by the way. He's my, he's my brother's and don't do that. You wanna play, I know. Someone had to watch him. Uh, so, I just got out of Horrible Bosses 2 and Non-spoiler version, this is worth a watch. If you can get a matinee ticket, if you can have a free ticket, even better. If not, just wait till it comes out on DVD. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't, I can call this a Horrible Bosses 2 sequel, even though it's quite clear that this never started out as a Horrible Bosses movie. The, it, it seemed like someone, the, there's four writers credited to this, two for the screenplay alone. Uh, it, it's pretty, quite clear that they had another movie, and someone was reading the script and said, Hey, what if we change the main characters to those guys from Horrible Bosses? Yeah, this would be so much funnier! We can market it as a Horrible Bosses 2 sequel! Now we may have to do a couple of little rethings and throw in a pointless cameo here and there, which there are a few on, in this film. And But granted, it was funny. It was funny. It, it didn't have me laughing as much as Dumb and Dumber 2, but it still had me pretty much cracking up. Uh, for those who don't mind spoilers, uh, let's go into that. Um, the good in this film is that the acting, minus one person who feels horribly underused, is amazing. It, it's all the big names from before, plus Chris Pine, who proves that he can hold his own in this really Three Stooges-esque style acting. It that that kind of leads into a bad, but all, at the same time, I like the Three Stooges. I like that kind of, of who's gonna get smacked in the head? Oh no, you're the one being stupid. Oh, but I think you're all being stupid. Whoosh! Yeah, that's that's the one. I kind of like that. And it gives you a really, really, really big feel of that throughout all of this. Uh, so, uh, Norman Bates, the guy who's in everything, and Charlie Day, uh, they are all very good. Although, Char it just feels like they were always they were playing cutouts of who they were before. Before, they felt like three people who had quirks, who ha acted in kind of... A Three Stooges esque style. In this one, no, they're doing a Three Stooges routine through the whole movie, and it is so freaking obvious too. It's. I'm not gonna call it bad because yes, I like it, but it's. I can see someone else not liking that, for that reason. Um. Going on, Jennifer Anderson. Oh my God, she was like the most funniest one in this entire film. <laughs> She comes back as the uh, boss who, not not as the boss, because they've all quit their jobs. Uh, the 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 run up of the the plot summary basically is that they've all quit their jobs because they had an idea about a product they can market, which is the shower buddy, and it's a shower head that automatically dispenses the shampoo and conditioner while you're underneath it. It's it's a novelty gimmick, but. It's one that I could see actually working. The problem is, is that it kind of undoes everything that the first movie kind of set up. And yes, that tastes like popcorn. Yes, it does. Um, the the first movie, uh, when they all ended, they all ended and they got their jobs where they wanted. Uh, Nate Norman Bates got his promotion. The guy who's in everything uh, after his boss was killed. <laughs> Spoiler! Uh, a new person takes over the company and she actually runs it like an intelligent person. And he's happy with that. And uh, Charlie Day's character manages to blackmail the rapist Jennifer Anderson into not sleeping with him so that they can have a nice, healthy work relationship. And it, it undoes all of that by saying they all quit their perfect jobs that they worked an entire movie to get. Oh, we worked for, they, they start out by doing an interview about the shower buddy and they've, oh, we all work for horrible bosses. Yeah, 
You took care of that, remember? Uh, but anyway, they, they came up with the idea for the shower buddy. They spent their money, built a prototype, went into their own business for themselves, and they decided to show it off. To key, and, uh, to key and some girl I've seen in other comedies before that I can't really name at the moment because it, it, it's one of the things that was bugging me about the film. I've seen this girl before, but uh, they they're showing it off. They end up getting in business with a ruthless businessman. Ah, uh, yes, twirly mustache, and he's the guy who was horribly underused. It's a I don't know the actor's name, but it was the same person who played the uh, Sherlock Holmesian. Uh, not see inside of Inglorious Bastards, the one that um, crap, what's his name? They, uh, he's the one that sells out Hitler to Brad Pitt at the very end of the film, uh, so that he can come to America with fuel, uh, with immunity. And he does that really, really funny spiel where he's on the phone with the guy. He's like, I think the whole section should get awards for this. Preferably medals from the press and teacher stapping wonders on big national television about how awesome we all are. And, you know, that hilarious guy. And he was the only one who was horribly underused. There was maybe one scene that he could have, uh, that he brought anything to, and it got a chuckle out of me. But everything else in this film, my god, you could replace him with anybody, and nothing would have changed in this movie. At all. And that is sad. That is really sad. Uh, you brought a very funny actor into this role, only to literally kill him off. Both acting-wise and literally at the end of the film. I mean, it's... Okay. But shout out to Chris Pine. I, I did not know that you could do comedy like that. And that was impressive. Very impressive. Anyway. Um, yeah, so they're getting... Uh, Biz they get into business with this guy, and he tricks them into buying a bunch of shit and uh, getting so much more money than they can pay back, and then undercutting them from the deal so that they have to floor clothes. He can buy their business after the fact and get out and get rights to their product, where he's already literally got two jet. Uh, uh, Chinese stereotype standing behind him saying, "These lovely gentlemen will be able to put out our new product, the Shower Pal." Yeah, he, he, I was waiting for him to twirl his mustache. It was pretty bad. And, ah, uh, the sort, I don't like it when people use the, the businessmen like that, because they don't feel real. They feel like carbon cutouts, especially when he goes on and on about having to work hard and have to, to get everything. It's, yeah, uh, two-faced bullshit. That's not funny. And it's commentary that, frankly, is not good. It sets in a stereotype and it's dumb to see. I've seen it in so many films, I could quote this guy's lines word for word, except for the one scene when he's actually explaining how he screwed them over, that he actually does bring some laughter and personality to. Everything else is so generic. Um, yeah, so they come up with the idea of kidnapping and I've heard that the plot of this movie is basically a plot of another movie from like 96 or 97 called Ruthless People. I've never seen it, so I can't attest to that, but I have heard people uh, say that. And it has like Danny DeVito, and he's basically the Chris Pine of the group. It's... and I would... I'd actually say that makes a lot of sense. Because, yeah, this movie does feel a lot like it was something else. You could very easily tell that this was just someone's putting the horrible boss title on it. I already said that, but yeah, it, it's its biggest detriment. I mean, it wasn't bad as far as you could go, and I can completely say that this is a horrible boss sequel. Unlike other films that have tried to do this, where it's like, okay, none of these characters act the same, none of the characters do the same shit, and it's... And, by God, the... As much as I thought this film was kind of funny, the funniest part in this film, by far, was the outtakes in the end credits. They, they When the end credits start, they start doing the, the outtakes of the old scenes where they're all screwing up and they're all having a good time, making actually funny jokes and playing off of each other. <laughs> Chris Pine's uh, big scene where uh, 
guy everyone knows, I think they call him Kurt in the film, and Charlie Day, Dale are behind him, and they keep like repeating everything he says before he finishes the sentence. And he's supposed to get frustrated with them, and eventually he turns around and just like, I got this, I got this. And they start keep going, shut up! It, it's, it's a funny bit, but just showing the outtakes of that, how many times he cracked up trying to do this right. And it, it, it really does bring a lot of camaraderie and shows that these guys know what they're doing and that they, they were having fun all of it. It's, the outtakes were funnier than the actual movie. It almost makes you want to say, make a mockumentary out of it with just your outtakes. I mean, that would have been hilarious. Um, but for what we got, we got nothing bad. It wasn't... You know, oh, this is the worst thing I've ever seen. It, it played a lot of safe jokes, just like Dumb and Dumber 2, but it did a lot of really good ones. As I said, Jennifer Aniston is hilarious in this film. Um, there's one scene where uh, Norman Bates has to cover for the other guys while they're hiding inside of a bathroom because they're stealing the nitrous gas, and uh, Darren Franson comes in with a, uh, a sex addiction anonymous group. To try to... Yeah, it's pretty... So, Norman Bates, trying to, to buy time and save them, <laughs> go, thinks, thinks he's walking into an AA meeting. An Alcoholics Anonymous. So he starts talking about how he has to... He, he was chug, chugging and double fisting some. Well, he's, he's talking about having beers with the guys. And it turns out, no, no. Everyone thinks that he's... Uh, <laughs> That he's talking about doing it with guys. He's, and of course it comes with a misunderstanding. And the guys inside of the uh, bathroom hiding out think that this is actually true by the end of it. And they keep bringing it up as like a little repeat insult going on. Which did add a little bit more flavor to their three stooges bit. But Jennifer Aniston is getting turned on by this and when he when Norman Bates finally figures out that he's in a sex meeting and uh, no, 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 he actually decides to play along with it <laughs> and he's making up some story involving a 14 year old boy in a wrestling camp <laughs> where Jennifer Aniston literally stops the meeting, hushes everyone away so that she can sleep with Norman Bates. I didn't see that coming, but it was fucking hilarious. And when she shows up at the end, which is another one of those ones, like, yeah, you could have, you didn't need this inside the film. This is just more, oh look, it's horrible bosses too. <laughs> but she made it work with a pretty hilarious bit about having to uh, sleep with all three of them in order for the plan to keep going. It's it's pretty damn funny. It and she's a hoot. Uh, Jamie Foxx comes back. He's a pretty awesome part, also. Uh, especially the car chase scene. <laughs> I won't, I won't spoil that, but look forward to that car chase scene because it is pretty funny. <laughs> especially when you find out about his little kittens. Sorry, he doesn't have a dog like I do. Aww. He was really, really bored and apparently didn't want to be on film. Go figure. Oh well, I have to start wrapping this up because I gotta head out to work. Because this is not actually midnight, and yeah. So, uh, final verdict on all of this is it's a comedy. Some people will find it funnier than I did. It was still pretty funny. It just didn't have me laughing as hard as I thought it would. The first Horrible Bosses felt really relatable. Uh, we've all had horrible bosses. And I'd be lying if I said that there wasn't a time when they pissed me off to the point where I thought of violently running them over with my car. Everyone's had horrible bosses. And that's what made the first one relatable. The second one isn't relatable. It's them, yes, seeking their own dream and trying to become their own bosses, but getting screwed over by someone who's not their boss and going in with this big kidnapping plan that's not really well thought out at all. It's trying to so horribly be the first film again, it kind of deters from it being its own unique identity. So, yeah, my final verdict still stands. I still say 
if you can find it, if you can get into the theater for cheap, like a matinee, or if you're part of the West, uh, no, we're not West Stakes, uh, Megaplex rewards program, such as me, you can actually get a uh, dollar matinee ticket, or a free matinee ticket. I use the dollar. Which is probably why I like this movie a lot more than other people would. But, uh, yeah, if you can get into the theater cheap, do it. If you can't, just wait for it to come out on DVD. It's not worth a full price ticket. And you're going to enjoy it anyway. So, uh, next week is going to be The Hobbit, Battle of the Five Armies. Uh, is there anything else coming out next week that I know, know about, trailers-wise? I think that they were all overshadowed by the fact that The Hobbit is coming out next week. So, uh, yeah, The Hobbit, and with that, Archer leaves. So I'll see you all next time.